Okay, The Wanderer was an Old English poem. It was part of the Exeter book, which is one of our largest collections of Old English poetry or Old English writings, um, which was put to paper about 975 CE. Although we don't know the author of The Wanderer or any of the poems in the Exeter book, we do know that they were written by a single scribe um, who was well versed in writing both Old English and Latin, suggesting that he was learned. Um, although the date of composition of The Wanderer is uncertain, we have anywhere from people suggesting the 9th century up through the 10th century. So um, obviously with the terminus of the 975 CE when it was written down. So we know that it was about in those 200 years there, but because of Old English works coming down, sometimes copied through other manuscripts or coming from the oral tradition, we're never 100% sure of the date of a lot of these things. Um, James L. Rosier characterizes The Wanderer as a poem as a, quote, paradox of simplicity. This is because when we look at the, when we look at the poem, it seems very straightforward. And it seems like the wanderer, if anything, is very direct in what he's saying about what it means to live correctly in the era in which he's part. However, we're looking at an extremely complicated time period. And I think this is very important in, as we approach how to decipher the meaning of the wanderer. So the Anglo-Saxon period was a time of major transition in a lot of different ways. Um, we have probably most obviously we have the religious transition. So we have a pagan society going to um, into a Christian conversion. So, but we have at the same time we have them coexisting. We don't have a, a neat clean break in there. So we have both pagan elements and Christian elements appearing in Old English literature, which we see in The Wanderer, of course, and in poems like Beowulf and a plethora of Old English literature. Um, we also have at the same time, which goes hand in hand with the transition to Christianity, we have a transition from an oral society to a literate society. So prior to the arrival of Christianity, which brought with it literacy, then the Anglo-Saxons communicated via oral poetry. And looking at the theory put forth by Morton Bloomfield and Charles Dunn, that was primarily done for the purpose of what they call so-called wisdom literature. So it was to teach people the correct way of living. So this is a very different perspective than how we think of poetry being today. So again, something to keep in mind as we consider the meaning of, of the wanderer. The introduction of literacy also created um, editorial complexities that could also have bearing on the wanderer. Our medieval scribes who were copying down poems didn't have the same philosophy, didn't have the same approach that we do when we are trying to preserve something historically. They were not as interested in a faithful reproduction as they were sometimes correcting what they perceived as being wrong, sometimes putting their own agenda or their own spin on something. So the introduction of Christian elements is a common part of this. So we have that as well, making the wanderer more complex. And finally, and a third factor in the transition, sort of transition period that the Anglo-Saxons are going through, is we're really moving from a tribal culture to where the, the, the leader was very close with his people to an increasing distance there. And we're seeing some anxiety in literature at this point because of that, because people are perceiving a distance, an introduction of bureaucracy, you could say, into um, their relationship with their, their governor, so their, their king or their lord. Um, we have, coming from this then, approaching the Wanderer, we have several critical approaches. I'm going to go through a few of them that have some prominence. Um, the first two, I'm just going to say straight, straight off the top, I don't agree with. I have seen as being very problematic, but I'm going to go through them and address them and then talk about the native approach, the native Germanic approach that I prefer to take. Um, the first critical approach is one of, is a Christian approach. It's using the theory of compunction or the salvation of the soul to explain the wanderer and how the wanderer evolves. On this, one of the biggest problems I have with this is that it does ex ignore the, the ease with which um, Christianity and paganism coexisted in Anglo-Saxon society. Like I said earlier, they, it wasn't either or to, the, to these people. They, they were very comfortable with shades of gray in there. Um, Gwendolyn Morgan puts it as Anglo-Saxon wisdom literature, she says, 
expresses a tendency to synthesize differing views of life, attempting to reconcile the seemingly irreconcilable into a coherent expression of the nature of existence. The Anglo-Saxons were perfectly comfortable with introducing both Germanic or pagan and Christian elements. So to ignore one in favor of looking solely at the other, in my opinion, is, is a bit problematic. It also, taking a fully Christian approach, also tends to ignore the fact that the boss of the poem makes no mention of Christianity. You have uh, mention a Christian allusion in the first very beginning of the poem, and of course you have the poet achieving salvation at the very end of the poem. You have many, many, many intervening lines in there where we're looking pretty much solely at a, a Germanic approach. So that in that kind of encourages a, a degree of reach that I think isn't necessarily useful. To go back to the James M. Palmer theory of compunction that I talked about earlier, an example of this is that when he's talking about compunction, which is mentioned in Anglo-Saxon literature, he talks about how it always comes in, in conjunction with tears. So people cry as an expression of con compunction. However, if you've read The Wanderer, you know the Wanderer may moan and groan and lament and show all sorts of emotion, but he never cries. So how to reconcile this? Well, Palmer's theory is that the mention of the sea is to stand in as a symbol for tears or crying, which to me is very much a stretch. It's taking a, a and I say as a creative writer, you know, people often come to me and say, you know, I see this in your story and I'm like, oh, well, I'm really excited that you see that, but that's not what I intended. So assuming that there was that sort of intent from an Anglo-Saxon poet, I think is problematic. There's also a second approach is a Stoic approach. Um, this was particularly put forth by Thomas Hill. He was really, he really advanced this idea. Um, he claims the Germanic warriors were influenced by Stoicism. He says both the native variety and a Roman variety. He then proceeds to completely skip over the native variety entirely and go about some putting forth some theories on how the Roman Stoicism would have perhaps influenced the Anglo-Saxons to the point where we actually see it in their literature. He has a couple of ideas of how this could have happened. He says, you know, of course, at this point in time, then there, people were people who undertook classical study were, incur were encountering Stoicism as part of that. Okay, that's fine, but that assumes that the original poet was a monk, which I don't think is an assumption that we can make, or that he would have been learned in Latin, which, again, is not an assumption I think we can make. Um, he mentions that German auxiliaries were the first, were for centuries in contact with the Romans, that they were actually the first to arrive on the British island, and this is true. However, there was a significant language barrier, Latin and Germanic being from completely different language families first and foremost, and would there have been, as he says, enough acculturation, he calls it acculturation, would there have been enough acculturation between the two where they w we would have seen this sort of um, deep influence, deep internalization showing up in multiple Anglo-Saxon sources? I don't know that that's a conclusion that I'm comfortable drawing. Um, he mentions one of the, and this is a, something that's brought up a lot, a paradox is that, you know, the while the poet encourages moderate emotion, then at the same time, he is showing a high level of emotion himself, and that betrays stoicism. It does not, however, betray an approach that you take with looking at native Germanic ideas. So native Germanic ideas are the approach that I prefer to take, and that I will take in talking about what the Wanderer teaches us about right living. So let's take, first of all, a closer look at lines 64a through 72b. These are lines that pretty much give us a very good summary of what the poet thinks is right living for a Germanic warrior. He says, therefore man cannot call himself wise before he has a share of years in the world. A wise man must be patient. He must never be too impulsive, nor too hasty of speech, nor too weak a warrior, nor too reckless, nor too fearful, nor too cheerful nor too greedy for goods, nor, too ev nor ever too eager for boasts, before he sees clearly. A man must wait when he speaks oaths until the proud-hearted one sees clearly whether the intent of his heart will turn. Okay, so Scott Guara, Scott, Scott Guara sorry, I always mangle this poor man's name. Scott Guara um, 
talks about those lines in detail and what this can show us about native Germanic warrior wisdom, using citing other sources other than the wanderer to show that these are ideas that were prevalent throughout Anglo-Saxon society. We don't need to reach out to external sources for explanation of them. We don't need to retrofit our poems to ideals or ideas that came from outside of Germanic culture. So he talks about how the poet at this point is urging especially discretion. And this is important because he's saying that you, it's not even, it's not an issue of moderation because we're talking about warriors who engage in all sorts of immoderate things all the time. You know, he says, don't be too greedy. You know, we might say, don't be greedy at all, but he accepts that these are warriors we're talking about. They're going to be greedy at times. You know, they're going to, to rob and pillage and so on as part of their, as part of what they do. So he's saying that, you know, what you need to show is you need to show discretion. You don't want to show too much excess. And he's positing that wisdom comes from experience. And this is very important because we have experience leading to the avoidance of excesses in behavior. So we have a, 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 um, a progression here. So we have a lack of adversity equals no expectation of setbacks equals rash behavior or stupid decisions that end up getting a person killed or into something they can't get themselves out of. He says that wisdom, that suffering setbacks, that suffering, like we see the poet in The Wanderer doing, significantly suffering, is what creates wisdom because it's what gives a person a perspective to therefore understand that they're taking the right action. And he characterizes this as courage. Right action equals courage. So when we're talking about what the, war the Germanic warrior would have considered to be good behavior, it's not an avoidance of greed and violence and all those things, because then he wouldn't be a warrior anymore. It's knowing when he's being too excessive. It's knowing when he's making the right decision. And it's over time, accepting, you know, coming to accept that the suffering and the things that, the bad things that have happened to him, maybe from bad decisions or some from circumstances beyond his control, weird as the Anglo-Saxons would have called it, which is their version of fate. Not necessarily fate as, you know, controlled by a higher power, but just sort of the motion of a person, the progress of a person through circumstances that's completely oblivious, you know, could care less about anything human, you know, could care less about you know, accomplishing anything. It's just the, the progression through that. So um, having endured weird would have created wisdom to, this, to the Anglo-Saxon um, warrior. Okay, and looking at the poem as a whole, okay, we honed in on these couple of lines, but now looking at the poem as a whole, we have a couple of ideas coming through. We have, well, to summarize the poem as a whole, we have our wanderer, he's out and about, you know, he's, he has, he has lost his lord in violence. Um, he has lost his comrades in violence. He's now suffering exile, which is one of the worst fates for our Anglo-Saxon warriors. And he's sad about this, understandably, and upset. But towards the end of the poem, then he he accepts Christian salvation. So we have a couple of interpretations for this. We have um, Robert Bjork, who's one critic who sees as, um, in his words, he says, the sage, the, well, the wanderer is, the sage who transforms the inferior world-bound, essentially hopeless exile tract of the Germanic world into the superior heaven-bound, hope-filled one exile tract of the Christian faith. So he sees that the wanderer is completely shucking off his pagan Germanic past and completely embracing a, a, a Christian worldview. Um, this is not the only way to, to look at this. We have some sort, we have a second set of theories that consider that, you know, the, the wanderer may be more integrating Christianity and Germanic um, ideals. This is personally, I think more in keeping with what we know of the Anglo-Saxons, that they were very, that they were very comfortable, as I said earlier, with merging the two. They didn't see Christian and pagan or Germanic as mutually exclusive. They could very easily reconcile the two in their mind. So at this, we have um, Lawrence Beeston being one of the primary critics that's putting forth ideas here. And he says of it that, well, he looks at, he looks at the structure of the poem. He looks at the language of the poem. And he sees that the, the wanderer is using the present tense to talk about his, his sadness 
even as he's talking about his salvation. So he uses this, this to conclude that his hardships, quote, his hardships, his sorrow at the loss of his lord and his comrades, his sadness at being far from his kinsmen are very real to him, even in the moment he affirms his consolation. So we see here that merging of the Germanic and the Christian ideals. And Beeston then uses this to conclude that the poem is less about abandoning Germanic ideals for Christian so much as it is about the poet having the courage and self-affirmation to embrace both of these ideals, the, the Anglo-Saxon culture and Christian salvation. So to conclude, I would like to leave with the last passage from the poem, which I think illustrates what we can take from the poem as a whole. So we have, um, so spake the wise man in his mind, where he sat apart in council. Good is he who keeps his faith, and a warrior must never speak his grief of his breast too quickly, unless he already knows the remedy. A hero must act with courage. And then we have the wanderer embracing his salvation when he says, It is better for the one that seeks mercy, consolation from the Father in the heavens, where for us all permanence rests. So first of all, we have again um, the idea of urging discretion and endurance as a mean to, means to acquire wisdom. So that's an important idea in Anglo-Saxon poetry in general. We have the wisdom allowing the warrior to correctly perceive the right action for a particular circumstance. I think that what he's doing here is he's perceiving that salvation is the right action in this circumstance. So that doesn't mean that he's abandoning his Germanic past. It doesn't mean that he's abandoning entirely his Germanic culture. But he's discerned through contemplation, or discretion if you will, that an acceptance of Christian salvation is a means of transcending the ruin that he perceives at the end of the poem and finding hope amid his grief. So I think this is very much in keeping with the idea of discretion as an important um, tool to right living, of enduring suffering as a means to achieve wisdom, and finally through that wisdom being willing to accept salvation.